Hi, everyone. Um, the latest interview I just uh, posted is with Ron Pierre, who's a philosopher, a writer, a blogger, who's well known for writing on collapse, society, psychology, freedom, uh, the West, drugs, consciousness, technology, uh, different modes of living, financial freedom. Um, he's a very, very interesting person, and I had the pleasure to speak to him. Uh, it was too short. We could have spoken a lot more about a lot more topics. Um, but I hope that this short interview gives you a sense of who he is, what he's thinking about, and maybe challenges some of your current thinking and uh, leads you down some interesting uh, questions. So I hope you enjoy it. Here it is. Thanks so much for taking some time. I've been a reader of your essays for many, many years, and um, okay. I've watched some of your documentaries, but um, I think I get a sense of who you are, but if you were to introduce yourself to someone new who's never read one of your works, what's your first kind of statement usually on who you are oh. or what you're into? Oh, I don't know. I've, I've, been, I've been doing a blog for about 20 years. Um, I, I used to write about... Um, I guess I say I used to write about like like the critique of civilization, and I don't really write. Now I'm writing more about like psychology and and metaphysics, and less about uh, politics and society. But I'm still kind of interested in that stuff. Um, you know, I'm I'm writing a novel. Uh, it's going very slowly. Uh, I just like to to think about things and write about things. So maybe we can start there, since you're in um, Seattle and you're more interested in the psychology. I was watching uh -huh. the short documentary about you, and I think a lot of, I wouldn't call you a, I guess there's like not a prepper, but a doomer, but there's kind of a sense of a meaning of crisis in the West, and uh -huh. I'm curious where you think that comes from. The sense, where does the sense of crisis come from? Yeah, um, the meaning I, of crisis in the West, possibly. The, the meaning of crisis, like, like. Like why, what meaning do people get out of thinking there's a crisis or, um, I mean, I can talk, I can talk a little bit about like why people might, what, what sense of meaning people might get out of, I mean, I think there is a crisis. I mean, I think, I think, uh, I think there's a lot of things that are going on right now that are, that, that can't keep going the way they're going. Um, and you know, I used to be more of a more of a doomer. I still think that that there's going to be a lot of big changes. I think we're like in the middle right now. We're in the middle of a of a slow collapse, um, and people get a sense of meaning about. Um, say, well, um, I think that's part of the reason that that we're in a slow collapse is the is people want to be part of something. Um, people want to feel like they're they're participating in something that they feel good about and society is not doing a very good job of giving that feeling to people. So, um, you know, they, they get into other things and other movements, some of which might destabilize, uh, the system that we've got, uh, people might, I mean, it's, it's fun to imagine that everything is going to collapse and that, I have these special skills other people don't have to make me do better than other people. And a lot of people like to think that way. So that's, you know, that's where more I might put at the intersection of meaning and collapse. And where do you think, why do you think society is failing to give meaning to Western kind of modern people? Um, um, why do I think it's failing? Well, I mean, the, you can see this, and a lot of things where something starts out, when something starts out, people are excited about it, and then and then it just builds up all kinds of like like cross. It builds up lots of stuff that's that's uh, that's just added on, and uh, and it's easy to it's easy to add stuff and hard to take stuff away. There's a there's an important book that I haven't read, but you know everybody talks about it, um, the collapse of complex societies by Joseph Tainter, and he just talks about how complexity societies keep adding complexity incrementally it's easy to add complexity incrementally and hard to remove it incrementally so they just tend to like build up more and more complexity and then lose a bunch of complexity all of a sudden so um you know you could look at like how, how much more expensive it is now to build things than it used to be you know if you want to build a build a tunnel or a new subway it's 
you know, even accounting for inflation, it's way more expensive. And nobody is sure exactly why that is, but it's just the, I think it's just the society gets more complex and, and the more complex it gets, the more clunky it gets. And part of that is the ability to provide meaning. I think um, I've, I can go on a bit of a tangent. I'm optimistic about, about the unconditional basic income. If we get something like that, then, um, you know, what people want is they want to do things. They, they, the goal, the goal for society should be, should be a society that builds itself upward from what people enjoy doing. And, and, um, it's, it's hard to do that. And, and a society might originally build itself upward from what people enjoy doing. And then people are just doing it to go through the motions and not really enjoying it. Like, like in, in ancient Egypt, the first great pyramid was better than the second. And the second was better than the third. I think it's because for the first great pyramid, people were excited about like, oh, that's cool. We're going to build a pyramid. And then they built it. And they're like, oh, man, another pyramid. But that was all they, they knew how to do. Um, so, that, you know, just I'm just trying to kind of triangulate this whole idea of why, why society starts to feel less meaningful as it goes on longer. Do you think um, other civilizations have the same decadence of collapse, like Asian um, or Russian or Middle Eastern or developing? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think the same dynamic happens all over the world. I don't think this is a uniquely a, a Western problem. It is a is a modern problem in that there's never been so much so much complexity as there is right now, um, and and just so much so many things we have to keep track of um, and, and not all that stuff is going to be fun and some of it's going to be tedious. And, but I don't think it's, this is uniquely Western at all. I think it's, uh, I mean, there's, there's a, yeah, I think it's just uh, it's just modern. It has to do with the, uh, you know, humans are always going to try. Humans have been trying a lot of things that we've never tried before. And we, we uh, tend to mess it up and try to do it the wrong way a bunch of times until we get it right. That's happening right now all over the world with with like the internet and social media, um, and uh, yeah, lots of lots of technologies that uh, that we haven't worked out how to work work them well yet, and we're working in a way that's not satisfying. So, um, do you know who Balaji is? He's that uh, South Indian American um, kind of venture capitalist, uh, philosopher, writer, Bitcoin guy, and he's modeled okay. the future the future based on what he considers three contemporary forces, that being okay. what he calls the CCP model, which is the Chinese kind of uh, okay. state versus uh -huh. um, the kind of what he calls the NYT New York times future model, where it's like kind of a progressive eco kind of authoritative uh -huh. state versus the BTC model which is the Bitcoin kind of decentralized utopian anarchist uh, model. So uh, Peter Thiel okay. also has a similar model, but he calls it Sharia law versus the CCP model uh -huh. versus eco hyper kind of progressivism like European or okay. so I'm curious if you're in Seattle and Washington and you're kind of worried about collapse. Do you? Uh -huh. What's your future image of what is going to collapse, and what's the future? Is it a Mad Max image? Is it a CCP kind of China image, Sharia um, law image? I'm just curious what you think. Yeah, you use the term um, long emergency, kind of the long slow collapse. But I'm curious what you see the future as. Yeah. Well, I, I have to break it down into different things. Um, you know, I don't. I don't. And one one of those things is technology. Another one of those things is, is the economy, um, and if I could just start with those, like like I think there's, there's I think economic collapse is, is inevitable, and there's going to be like like the economy is based the economy we've got is based on uh, perpetual growth, exponential growth, and uh, and there's no way we can keep having exponential growth. I think I think we're probably actually already done with the age of exponential growth, and they're just kind of counting things counting things that uh, they shouldn't count to try to argue that uh, that try to get economists to try to create the illusion that we still have exponential growth and we don't. Um, but, you know, we're going to have to figure out a way to live 
without that. So there's going to be all kinds of economic troubles. Um, and technology, um, my latest thinking on that is it's not going to be, it's, it's not going to be monolithic or global. It's going to be different everywhere. Like there's going to be, there's going to be really advanced, uh, really, I mean, technological um, innovations and ventures are going to continue. Uh, there's going to be like lots of cool stuff and, and materials and, uh, and lots of kind of questionable stuff and AI. I mean, it's exciting stuff, but dangerous stuff. Um, uh, there's, there, there's going to be lots of cool technological stuff and dangerous technological stuff continue to happen all through this. Um, but in other places, it's going to totally go to hell. Um, you know, there might be like, there might be some neighborhoods that are Mad Max like, but, but it's not going to be a, on a global scale. Um, yeah. And yeah, that's all I can think of right now. I mean, I don't really know much about, I don't know much about China at all. It's such a big subject that I haven't really, really looked into it, but they're, you know, they're going to be in trouble because their system is also based on um, perpetual growth. You know, an Americans continue to, to buy more things that the Chinese are making. And, uh, you know, they have their own troubles with, with the limits of authoritarianism. You going to, to limits of authoritarianism, I used to be more of a fan of the concept of UBI, but I think uh -huh. the whole last two years of COVID have made me very nervous about UBI. And the uh -huh. potential of UBI being connected to state requirements. I'm just curious if you have any kind of fears of UBI being limited to authoritarian aspects. Or I don't think. I mean, I mean the okay. The the best thing would be not to have a UBI, but just have everything necessary to be free. But that's that's really hard to pull off in practice. So, you know, I think I see the UBI as a as a transition from a more of a top-down economy to more of a bottom-up economy where people can, uh, can, if people's basic needs are taken care of, then they can uh, work more t for quality of life and less for money. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I ran for my, my fears is let, let's say you live in Singapore and, you know, uh -huh. a modern technocratic state uh, uh -huh. and you get your U UBI a thousand Singaporean dollars a month. Uh -huh. and, then they start requiring you, you know, if you didn't get the latest booster, oh, we saw you spit on the ground one oh, time. Oh, yeah. There's a lot I of mean, then carrots and then it's, associated with the UBI. Then it's not unconditional, is it? Then it's, then it's, then it's a conditional basic income, and that's, that's not good. It's got to be it's got to be something that oh, everyone gets. I think, so I your think definition you is unconditional. I, I, I didn't hear yeah, that, so that. Yeah, that's what the U is. Yeah, unconditional. Everybody, I mean, and I... I, I See, you're right. I mean, that's a real danger that they're going to do that, and they're going to call it the unconditional. They're going to call it unconditional. Well, really, it is conditional. I mean, you're probably right. That's going to happen uh, in some places and, and to some extent. So, so then you know the the, the challenge is to, to try to keep it, try to make sure that uh, that they can't take it away for for things like that, for you know, for any reason really. I mean, I think have you heard of, should get it. Go oh ahead. no, yeah. Uh, have you heard of central bank digital currencies? Um, yeah, uh, that sounds, yeah, I don't really, I don't really, that's not really something I follow, but, uh, but, uh, yeah, I don't really know much about that. Uh, it's just a way to create debt mechanisms. So instead of the central treasuries creating money and then giving it to banks, they would okay. give it directly to the end user via an app. So like the digital one in oh, China okay. has that. Okay. And, but the problem is then they can have negative inflation or turn off your cash based on whatever they do. So if you, in China, oh, you said the word Tiananmen and then they'll just turn off your cash. So yeah. something similar is happening in the U.S. with like if you're, if you say anything wrong on PayPal, then they'll just turn off your PayPal account. Or if we saw that in, um, you remember in Canada with the truckers, they got their bank accounts turned off and things like that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that. That's a danger. They could totally do that. Um, the and you know that's that's just. I mean, there's a constant struggle. It's never going to end. The struggle for for people to like be able to live in a way that they that, that they enjoy living, and the struggle between that and like the other desire that people have when they have power to leverage that power into more power. Um, and you know, we're we're never going to be done with that struggle. We're just going to have to if they start if they. Uh, I mean, if people, I think. I think we're less willing humans as a whole 
are less willing to see people starve and die from from lack of having necessities. I think uh, you know, I think practice as it works out like that, there's going to be like the people who uh, don't obey or whatever. We are are going to live worse, but. Uh, so that, that's um, interesting how you said. Do you think um, you have a tendency? I, I believe you're kind of in the underground and kind of counterculture always. But how do you maintain that freedom, that kind of philosophy of freedom? Um, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not. Can you phrase that another way? I'm not sure exactly what you're asking. I'm curious. How do you keep free in terms of your thoughts or actions against uh, a state? or a, a group that might be against those, you know, freedom. Oh, like, like how do I personally? Um, yeah. Uh, well, it's, I've just been lucky. I've, I've been lucky that I have enough money that I don't have to have a job. Um, that's, that's how I do it. And I, you know, and I don't, I don't spend a lot of money. I try to live, I try to live frugally so that the money I have will, will last the rest of my life. Um, but, but in general, um, you know, there's people just have to find some way to to, to make it through. There's there's going to be a there's there's a lot of niches. There's a lot of like people just have to find a niche and and uh, you know these are. I mean, I don't know. I'm starting to veer off and trying to trying to give advice to people who I, I don't know anything about. But I'll just say that, that yeah, for me, I've just been uh, I've just been lucky. You know, I I bought a house in Spokane. When the market was low and sold it when the market was high and I got some money from that. Um, yeah. And talking and about, this, go uh, ahead. No, Rand, I was going to ask you, where do you, you know, just maybe in terms of freedom, where do you see um, the counterculture now? Where do I see the counterculture now? In yeah. terms of freedom, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly. I mean, there's always going to be cultures and countercultures and, and uh, freedom is such a loaded word. Um, but uh, but I'll, I'll, before I talk about freedom, I just want to, I, I mean, if I were to define freedom, I like to define, I want like to say the most fundamental freedom is the freedom to do nothing. And all other freedoms come from the freedom to do nothing. If you don't have the freedom to do nothing, you don't have the freedom to, to do anything. It's like, it's like the, that's like the, the, the void from which everything is created is like, it's like I've got nothing to do, and we have nothing to do. Then you can figure out what you really want to do. Um, so, so for me, that's the basis of freedom. And uh, and but the word freedom gets thrown around a lot. And this this is a uh, like when people talk about freedom, sometimes they're talking about power. Like, okay, you're driving you're driving your car, and somebody cuts you off. That to you, it feels like power. They have exercised power over you by cutting you off. To them, it feels like freedom. They get to go wherever they want. So, so that's the constant trade-off of, of freedom versus power. And and our goal as society should be to uh, to have as much freedom as we can and as little power people having power over other people as we can. Interesting. Um, yeah. And then, Ren, right now, what kind of um, maybe I, I've followed some of your zine work and I've seen the development of your novel. Um, uh -huh. What kind of other things are you interested in right, right, right now? It could be anything from oh. technology, lifestyle, baking, anything. The, the, oh man, I've been, I've, I've been, uh, my latest obsession, you know, one of my favorite motivational quotes is from the, the filmmaker John Waters. Who said life is nothing if you're not obsessed? Um, so I just like to get obsessed with little things, and I've been obsessed lately with uh, with uh, hip of the '70s. Believe it or not, um, yeah, I grew up in the '70s, and uh, I remember a lot of songs from then. I've just been going back and, and re-listening to a lot of those songs I remember from the '70s and, and making playlists. So that's uh, that's my latest little obsession. Um, uh, but yeah, you mentioned baking. I'm doing a uh, I may, I'm starting to make pasta now, which is uh, surprisingly not that hard to do homemade pasta. It, it takes more time than, than uh, using pre-made pasta, but uh, it's, it's not hard and it's a lot better. So that's another little thing I'm doing. 
are you still interested in kind of the occult and panpsychism and some of those? Oh, totally. Oh, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm totally, uh, I'm, I mean, I don't, it's been a while since I've read any books on that stuff, but I'm always interested in, uh, in, uh, in woo woo stuff. Yeah. In, in the, uh, well, in, in models of reality other than materialism, um, and, um, just, uh, yeah, all kinds of, all kinds of weird stuff. And then where does that interest in the woo woo come from? Um, I don't know where it comes from. I, it's something that's always been there. I should always like, you know, it's, it's like, you like to look, I like to see the cracks. I like to look beyond. I like to, to, uh, to, um, see things that are, are not working the way they should and are, ah, it's hard to, man, it's not quite how I say it. Like, um, what is it exactly? Um, I mean, it's just, it's newness, it's novelty. It's, it's, uh, if the world's supposed to be this way, like like in terms in terms of like description of reality, and then you see something that doesn't fit, and like wow, what is that? Maybe it, you know, let me follow this thread and see where it leads. Um, the and there's the the idea that maybe outside of this, I mean, it's the whole it's the it's what the movie The Matrix uh, points to that the reality we see is is not the real reality and the real reality is more interesting um i I wonder if it comes down to some to a kind of boredom i don't know you want well i believe it go ahead i think he wonders if um you have a lot of writing about psychedelics and i think that Uh always opens up (laughs) questioning of reality and i'm just curious Uh if that has an overlap there or uh, you know i've you know i've used I've used psychedelics. I'm actually watching that, uh, the, the Michael Pollan TV show, um, how to change your mind. I read his book and, and something I noticed about his show, how to change your mind. They have all these psychedelic trip reports and every single trip report is better than any trip I've ever had or that anyone I know has ever had. They really, uh, they make it seem like every time you do psychedelics, you like go off in another universe and you explore all your past traumas and you come back a changed person. And uh, I'm afraid people are going to get their hopes up too much from watching that. Um, but, but I still think, uh, I mean, the, the, the insights that I've got from psychedelics are not, not that earth shaking, but, uh, but it, they really help me appreciate nature more. Um, that's my favorite thing to do. I mean, I haven't done, I haven't actually haven't done a psychedelics in quite a while. I haven't done a large dose in a while, but, uh, but when I do, I always like to go out and walk in nature and uh, I just appreciate a lot more, the, the beauty of, uh, of, well, when I, when I'm speaking carefully, I don't call it nature. I call it the non-human made world. Um, just the, and, uh, and compared to the non-human made world, the human made world looks, looks pretty clunky and ugly, but we have a lot of room to, to do it better. What do you think about the kind of democratization of psychedelics? Oh, like, yeah, I mean, I mean, look, it's, they're not, they're not, there, there's some problems. Um, they're not completely, um, you know, it's not, it's not completely miraculous, but, uh, but I think it's overall good that more and more people are using them. Um, and, uh, and I think overall that's going to be good for, for society. It's, you know, it's not, it doesn't automatically make you a better person to use psychedelics. And, and a lot of people uh, are going to use too many and, and fry their brains, but uh, but overall, I'm in favor of more and more people using psychedelics. And I think it's going to cause some some interesting changes in the world. I mean, I think it's inevitable. Going back to the occult, and um, I think you on one podcast I heard you were talking about. I think biblo. I heard the term bibliomancy. Yeah. Are you yeah, still I, using that, or how was that? You know. I, I do. It's it's a fun thing to do. You know, it's not, it's, it's, it's kind of like a parlor trick where you don't know exactly how it works, but, and the way, I guess after I wrote about it, I found out that the normal way that people use bibliomancy is to, uh, to open a book, you open a book at random, you riffle the pages, you put your finger down. And the way most people do it is they're looking for a phrase or a sentence. And, uh, and that's not how I do it. I like to, 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 go, go, to pull out a single word so i use a dictionary or uh 
only. I recommend a thesaurus to beginners because uh, it's more simpler answers. Um, but I use a dictionary. I just you know flip it around. Like I might be starting to write, and I'm like, let me uh, let me have an idea. Um, I say, give me a seed crystal for what I'm going to write about today, and uh, and you know our starting point. And I put my finger down, and there's a word, and and surprisingly often, the whatever word I land on is is either either fits the question or it's helpful. Um, so yeah, that's uh. It's 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 something I enjoy doing and it's something that's helpful and I don't want to I have to be careful talking about it because you can if people get in trouble like if you do it too much you can really get into a bad mental state where every time you need to make a decision you go I mean it could be it could be bibliomas it could be tarot it could be uh, uh whatever the, you know um the I Ching um whatever you're doing you could get in a pattern of like relying on it too much or taking it too seriously. So I have to do all these disclaimers, but uh, but if you know if you don't get if you don't get all wide eyed and and goggle eyed about it, if you uh, if you just say oh this is this fun thing and it's going to help me, then it, it get, I think it I uh, think it it could help. I'll find it helpful. Yeah. Do you have any religious practices, Ryan? No. Um. I mean, religious is a that's something I write about. Is it. religious is a hard word to it's a tricky word to define, but I guess you could say Biblia Mass is a religious practice, but um, I was raised Catholic, and uh, and you know I went to Catholic church, um, and at the time I did not like it, and I never, I, you know, I don't go to church now, but uh, but looking back, I kind of uh, appreciate the epic spirituality of Catholicism, you know how it it's, uh, it uh, really gives a sense of of a world beyond this world that's really like epic and beautiful. And uh, I know there's a the, the word religion points to a lot of things, and 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 some of those things are harmful, um, and some of them are necessary. Like one of the things it points to is is just uh, is community. It's like people being with a group of people who, who think the same way, and you know, that's that's oh, there's always going to be that, and. Uh, is a challenge if you're if you're choosing that group of people is is to make sure they're not thinking in a way that's, that's damaging or this this uh, veering off from reality. Um, so, are yeah, you I don't know, an I might, agnostic or atheist, or what's your spiritual belief system? Um, I I mean it's pretty much what any anyone who's done psychedelics says is that uh, <coughs> is that there's um, that. Um, Mind is more fundamental than matter. There is a there is a universal. Um, I mean, I, I don't use the word God because it it. Uh, I mean, sometimes you know, sometimes I use the word God because it's a really convenient word. But I don't want to give anyone the idea that I believe in a human shaped sky father deity. Um, that that's a silly idea, and and I think it's it's on the way out as as more people use psychedelics and as as the uh, patriarchal culture hopefully. The patriarchal culture is going to decline, and you know when people think about the the absolute, the universal, they're not going to think about some some old man. They're going to think about something that that's uh, way beyond uh, what we can understand. But you know we see a little sliver of of the universal, and uh, <coughs> um, so I, I guess I would say I wouldn't say I'm a religious or I wouldn't say an atheist because that kind of implies that implies uh, materialism, belief that the matter is fundamental reality. I don't like to say I'm religious because that implies um, belief in a, a sky father deity, but I believe in a, in a universal consciousness that we are all a part of, and uh, and there's all kinds of things uh, about reality that we can't understand from here. Do you think there are um, that universal force is only good, or are there evil forces? Or um, I, I, a quote I like is that uh, is that is that it contains um, you know call it the universal, call it God, whatever. It, it embraces all opposites. Um, so you know it's, it includes absolutely everything. So there's there's good in it, there's evil in it. Um, I I think uh, I think evil has 
has uh has this, you ever see the movie Time Bandits? That's uh it's one of my favorite movies. Um, it's like an early Terry Gilliam film. Uh, and there's this bit in Time Bandits where they run into they run into God, the supreme being, and they ask uh, this little kid, ask God, why is there evil? God says, oh, I, I forget, but that seems to me it has something to do with free will. So um, I, I think uh, one, one thing I like to imagine is, like people imagine, you know, you're going to die and you're going to go to heaven. What if, what if this, what if we're already in heaven right now, and, <laughs> and we don't know it because we've we've forgotten certain things, we've wandered off into a bad neighborhood of heaven, and and if heaven is heaven, it has to include the possibility to uh, oh man, <coughs> ah, there's some, been some smoke in the air lately. <coughs> Not very smoky. <coughs> wow. The air doesn't look very smoky, but I'm going to use cough. I'm going to see if I can go inside and see if it helps. Um, <clears throat> ah, ah, uh, I forgot what I was talking about. Let's see. I was talking about, uh, about the idea yeah. that uh, if we're oh, already evil. in heaven. Oh, yeah, correct. In the neighborhoods of heaven. Yeah. They're, well, like, yeah, this could be like a bad neighborhood of heaven, and we're, we're trying to find our way back into a good neighborhood. Or, uh, you know, the, the there's, there's this famous uh question you know if, could god make a rock so big he can't lift it or could god make a burrito so hot that he can't eat it and uh and you could say that can uh can the universal consciousness forget that it is the universal consciousness and this that's a common insight that people have on psychedelics that, that you know that's like a cliche oh we're all god um i think i think that's that's basically right that that there is a universal consciousness that's divided itself up or duplicated itself uh, into all of us. And beyond that, it's really hard to say what's going on. Where is your universal consciousness emerge from? Uh, it's, it's, it's on the inside. It's not on the outside. It's like, uh, it's a, nice, a metaphor I like to think of is like, is like um, there's this, there's the universal consciousness that's like looking through different keyholes or pinholes, and it looks through a it looks through one keyhole and it and it sees what you see. It looks through another and sees what I see. You know, not just what we see, but what we experience. The, our, our whole sense of self, so your whole sense of self or my whole sense of self is is something larger that's making it itself smaller and constraining its uh, constraining its view. Uh, in different ways. So where does it emerge from? It 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 always existed. It's out. It's outside of time, and incomprehensible to us. But within have, us, it's. Go ahead. No, I was going to ask. Just related to consciousness, is do you have any thoughts on augmented reality and the relationship with consciousness? Um, augmented reality. Um, that's. VR, yeah. or, you know, like all the yeah. meta, you know, if if this is, I mean, a lot of people. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's, that's, I mean, that's that's a new path. I mean, augmented reality is like a new thing that the consciousness is doing. Um, at the same time, I wonder if we're just, I mean, there's two directions you can go with it. You can like, you can go outward or inward. You can go like, you can um, you can use it to go deeper and deeper inside of of. Uh, Inside of things, or oh man, having trouble putting this into words. But uh, but um, like, imagine you've got augmented reality that's trying to teach people how to do martial arts, and they go, they put on this full body suit, and they have this simulated person they're fighting. Um, you can only go so far simulating it. Or let's say somebody's trying to like figure out. How to do augmented reality about how to fix a car, how to how to repair an engine, and you can only go so far with the simulation um, before you have to go back to reality. You know, if you're trying to learn martial arts, you have to you have to go back to the real physical world. And it's funny because on one hand, I think the physical world is not exactly real, but but the physical world is where we work it all out, and um and 
you've got to get back to augmented reality has to remain anchored in in the physical world and if it veers off too much from it it will it will kind of make people insane and uh and be less effective um Rand, do you a think lot this about, go ahead reality is a simulation i mean i i think that's a nice metaphor i think uh I think this whole physical world, it's not that, now one way to think about it is this whole physical world is, is not really real because it's all being simulated. But, but the way I see it is this is the simulation. Like, like I'm a, I'm a flesh avatar and of something that I can't understand. And this whole physical world is, uh, the, it's, it's not that it's, it's not that it's not real because it's being simulated is that it is the simulation that we're all in and 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 this is what we have to work with it's like this is how um imagine you're just uh, you're just one mind like let's let's imagine solipsism like you're just one mind floating in space and you create this entire world uh you know and that's, that's solipsism is a cool idea because you can't be falsified it's like you can't prove this not true that you alone are, are floating in nothingness and imagining everything. Um, but then where, where it breaks down is like, okay, if I'm imagining everything, then where does all this stuff come from? Where does all the not me come from? Where does all this stuff come from that I'm not, that, where does surprise come from? Where is the, where is all this stuff come from to, that I'm, is not consciously part of me? You could say, well, it's, it's still me, but it's my subconscious. But, but in that case, it's much bigger. I mean, it, it doesn't really make sense to say it's only me, given that the part that's not me that I'm not conscious of is so much is so much bigger. Um, so trying to tie that back to like to like the physical world, it's like you're you're floating in space and you find someone else floating in space and you join together with them to make a world together. And then sometimes and there's two of you and there's three of you and there's four. And if it's just you you can do anything you're you know you can create anything it's just your conscious mind floating enough and that's creating anything you can create anything you want and it's the same way it's like a single player video game you know with uh, with good mods and good cheat codes you can do anything um but then if, as soon as it gets multiplayer you have to work it out with other people so so what i see the physical world as is just the physical world is what you get when you have multiple perspectives that are trying to reach agreement and uh and i don't know it's like it's like I think in one sense reality is a popularity contest, but then if reality is a popularity contest, who who gets to vote? And I think it goes far beyond humans. There's all kinds of of uh, perspectives or or beings or or aspects of consciousness that are are collaborating to decide what this world looks like, and and maybe humans aren't all that important in the whole scheme of it. Um. Well, Rand, that connects me to, have you ever done DMT? I never have. I would like to, but but uh, I know there's ways to, like, synthesize it from, like, morning glory seeds. I'm just too lazy to do that, so I'm just kind of waiting until someone gives me some. But I would like to do DMT. Yeah, never have. Have you read any of the research in DMT, like the, the beings or the prolonged DMT experiences? I have seen that people are trying to get it to, to make DMT that lasts for a longer trip that's that's a cool idea i mean maybe something bad will happen but i think they should try it i think it'd be fun i mean i mean uh yeah and i've you know i, I look at the psychonaut subreddit that's basically where i look where i that's the only like psychedelic community that i look at regularly is the, the psychonaut subreddit they're always talking about like like uh uh machine elves and various dmt entities that you run into um i've never and and you know, I haven't ever used a big dose of any psychedelic. I've always just using just regular kind of small doses, but I've never actually hallucinated. I've never seen anything. It's not there. My mind has never gone off into some other world. Um, so it would be cool to to do that sometime. Yeah, there's a a neuroscientist out of Okinawa, Andrew Gallimore. I think he's in charge of that DMT kind of psychonaut extension program. It's very fascinating. Okay. Cool. They're just yeah, just trying to enter into that other world for longer to see what happens or what they can learn or take back or a lot yeah. of interesting. Um, have you ever 
I don't know if you've ever done heard of the Game of Life computer science program. It's like uh, a, yeah, I, I think I yeah I think I read about that a long time ago. Can you re remind me about what that is? Well, every first year computer science student basically learns the game of life and you set up these rules and it almost looks like a checkerboard. Oh you put yeah, yeah. Little bacteria on there and you set rules. Like if the bacteria is next to another bacteria, they mate. If it's next to three, right, they fight. Right. And then what happens, these self emergent um civilizations emerge just from basic rules. And yeah. a lot of people extend that then to reality that the rules are just beyond our grasp, but those rules are defining uh -huh. the consciousness or the reality. So it's similar to what you're talking about. Of, you know, it's just okay. the fast neuroscience and math and information. And so the DMT people want to enter that world because they think that's a way to see kind of the information behind this layer of reality. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, that's that's a cool idea. I have to wonder about the limits of the human brain to, you know, it's like it, maybe the these drugs put your brain temporarily into a state where you can see this stuff and then but you can't stay in that state and you have to come back to this state and then you're like, you like, you know, it made total sense when I was in there and now that I'm back here, it doesn't make sense. Um, so I wonder how that could line up with, how that could synergize with actual trying to actually change the human brain to, to have a different structure. And, and that's, uh, yeah, that's getting at some real weird stuff. I think, I think uh, one of the technologies that is going to come along that uh, is going to be interesting and, and, and dangerous um but but also maybe fun is is brain hacking like i think there's the i think there's gonna be a lot of assuming we don't get a total tech crash you know when i'm talking about like doom i always have to keep the possibility open that we are going to get a total tech technology crash but, but if we don't if there's still people somewhere that are that are, are doing new stuff with technology i think uh brain hacking is going to be big like like uh you know whatever we can do by like it, it's going to get to a level where like or like LSD will seem primitive, like you take this molecule and put it inside your brain when you could actually like have implants in your brain that are doing whatever. Um, and I, I think the, I think there's going to be a lot of action on that front in the coming decades. So and, would you consider yourself a techno utopian then? Kind of. Well, uh, I don't, I, that man, no, um, I, I do, uh, I don't want to put that tag on me myself. I think, I think, uh, I think technology is going to do some cool stuff. Um, there's, you know, there's this, this quote from, uh, I think Arthur C. Clarke that says any sufficiently advanced technology is in this big older show for magic. And I like a variant on that, which is that any sufficiently advanced technology is in this thing show from nature. And that's, you know, when I, that's the insight I get when, when I'm a psychedelics is like, wow, everything, you know, you go out, you, you walk down to like a river in, in early summer and this, this is it. This is like these, these, these creatures, these plants and, and animals and water and whatever, they've, they've got a system that's robust, that's enjoyable. Um, and humans are like tinkering around trying to do our own thing just like that. And, you know, that we're trying to, to, to duplicate in our creations the uh, the uh, the heavenly nature of uh, of the non-human made world, and uh, so that's um, I I do think I'm a utopian in the sense that I think we can do a lot better, and I think inevitably we're going to do a lot better humans. I think uh, you know I think humans it's their nature that we try to we're always doing crazy new things and we make a lot of mistakes, and then eventually we uh, we start to get it right. I think we're still in a lot of, a lot of ways, still in the mistake making phase. Are we going to get right? And uh, I think in a thousand years, um, they look back at, at us as as a uh, pretty brutish and, and primitive. And if we were to look a thousand years ahead of them, we'd say, oh, they're doing some cool stuff. But maybe they'd also be doing some stuff that we don't like. Um, so in that in that sense, I'm a utopian. Do you have any thoughts on kind of? biogenetics and some of i mean what are your oh. fears of technology in terms of like some of mine personally are just losing the aspect of humanity yeah i think i think that's the way that humans could actually go extinct if we if there's one way 
if you ask me like what what way is most likely for humans to go extinct is through biotech where we like or like we're going to make this this change to our own genomes that that looks like an improvement but because we're so excited it's not an improvement and and it makes things worse and we can't go back the way it was before and we go extinct I, that's a real possibility that humans are gonna gonna drive ourselves into extinction through irreversible um biotech um and but um but then you know when i talk to people who like actually know more than i do about about uh genetic technology it's really hard it's not like it's not like the dna is like a blueprint where you go in and you're like oh we're going to give people wings it's it's really hard to uh to go in there and just get whatever changes you want you kind of have to muck around and uh and try different things and then something comes out that is not what you expected um so so yeah there's but but we're going to do it like humans are going to do crazy stuff with with uh, genetic technology and and uh it's going to be a interesting to see where it goes talking about genetics and um biotechnology and uh, even bio warfare do you have any thoughts on the last two years of covid or how has that been for you oh um um i mean i i uh i enjoyed quarantine because i like to stay home anyway um but uh and i, and I think one good thing that came out of it was the whole working from home thing um the I mean, here in Seattle, the, the King County administration building is now empty. They've gone 100% working from home. Um, and there's a lot of, a lot of places that, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's better overall. And I think it's going to, um, like there's a lot of managers, a lot of managerial jobs that are not really necessary. Um, and the managers want to keep people in the office because they have power over people, but people working from home, then, then things might work out better with, with fewer managers. I think the, so I think that's a big benefit this come out of COVID is, is uh, more working from home. Of course, it's, it's the class aspect, you know, the service workers can't work from home. Um, and uh, it's, it's funny, like the people who still had to work during COVID are the people who, uh, who make the least money. Um, so, uh, but, but, you know, a lot of people did get, are, are living better now because of COVID making, uh, making it easier to work from home. I read some of your thoughts on um, 9/11 on your website. Oh yeah, I, well, I ha go ahead. Well, I was going to ask, um, how do you feel about kind of? I call it kind of the mind virus of some of the you know that went on for the last two years or three years with the pandemic. Um, uh huh. I think the West lost a lot of ability to you know free speech. The psychological operations were clear. I'm just curious what you think about just some of the responses to the to the virus or the vaccine or anything like that the masking and the rules i mean yeah so i mean some of the rules are silly like you know early on they they actually said that it's not good to wear a mask and the reason they said that was they wanted to like save the masks for the medical places where they're really i mean it's it's, it's going to be clunky there's getting mistakes and um, but I, I think overall, I mean, you know, when, when COVID first appeared, I, my first thought was why, um, why are we taking so many precautions against something that only has a 1% death rate? But then I, it, it makes sense when you look at hospitals because if, if hospitals get overwhelmed, a lot of people would die, but not otherwise die. So, so the way I started framing COVID was as long as hospitals are not getting overwhelmed, we should call it a win. And, you know, we should just do whatever precautions are necessary. To keep the hospitals from getting overwhelmed and beyond that we should just let people get sick if they want um i mean i i think uh i mean i i think I'm, i understand why people are are afraid of vaccinations because there's a central authority saying you've got to put this thing in your body um but you know when i looked at the science it looked pretty good i i got i got i got the facts i got the moderna vax um and I think it helped me when I got COVID to, to get less sick than I would have got. I think it's a pretty interesting technology, the, the mRNA thing that they developed. And, and it might have, uh, it might have, uh, it might still not have it if we hadn't had to develop it really fast to, to try to fix COVID. What do you think about conspiracies in general? Do you think that's, uh, what do you think? Oh, like, I mean, I mean, it's, 
it's, you know, conspiracy is one of those words that, that points to a lot of things. But I mean, I, I think it's good for people to not take at face value what, what we're told and to try to figure things out on, on our own. At the same time, we've got, I mean, with the internet, it's really easy to, to, uh, to just um, create these groups that, that kind of uh, veer off into beliefs with, I mean, you can, you get into echo chambers really easily and, uh, and um, it's, it's easy. I mean, it's human nature to want to tell beautiful stories. I think that's where a lot of this comes from. Like you want to, you want to tell a story about the world that's, uh, that makes the world seem more exciting and more fun to live in. And, and the internet allows us to self filter where we get our stories from and people can go off and, and, find their own their own stories that that paint a world that that seems more exciting for them to live in or more meaningful and they can find other people who, who back up from that and uh um I, just, I i stopped writing about politics because i i just got tired of arguing but uh but i'll, I'll say this about trump is that he's a he's a political coal reader he's like you know a cold reader is someone who uh who uh like someone who like like a fake psychic who will like say, oh yes, I've been thinking of a person named Jeff. And it was like, oh yes, yes, you know, my brother's named Jeff. And they Trump does that on a massive scale where he'll quote, he'll just say say stuff, and whatever people respond to, he says more of that stuff. Um, and uh, and and that's you know that's why he he became president because he's so talented at doing that. Um, but that's also what what the internet in general does is. Uh, is you know if you're if you start thinking about a certain way and you plug it in it can reinforce that and you can get like i mean this ai is going to do some crazy stuff like like bots um that i mean reddit has i'm on reddit a lot and there are more and more bots on reddit and uh and my view of ai which i mentioned on a, on a blog a couple weeks ago is that uh is that it's i think the way I, to look at it is it's, it's something created by humans and AI is part of the human story, and it's going to give humans. Um, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what the intersection on the internet of bots feeding back what people want to believe, uh, or you know, feeding back stories that people enjoy telling each other, uh, and how that that could grow in in AI space. Ren, how do you avoid or do you drop into the echo chamber? Um, um, well, uh, so how do you, how do I avoid, how do I, how do I avoid dropping into an echo chamber is just to, or to even to, conversely, do you go further into it? Um, to go further into it is, I mean, I guess I've kind of done that a little bit in the past where you're like, you like, you're into something, I mean, I, and you, uh, I mean, to go into it is like, it's, I guess it's sort of like you can almost put in, in terms of a, you can always define it in terms of the body. Do you feel like your body's expanding or do you feel like it's contracting? Um, or, you know, you could just say the mind is expanding or contracting and, and to go, it's, it feels good to contract. It feels good to zoom in. It feels good to look at smaller and smaller things and see more importance and value in smaller and smaller things. And, and I, uh, I try to resist that by like, by, you know, it's, and the nice thing about having a blog is, is, uh, people will tell me when I'm wrong. And, uh, and the readers have done that a lot over the years and it's helped me change my opinions a lot is to have to like, to have to like, uh, have people emailing me saying, Hey, here's some evidence that goes against what you're saying. So, so the way to avoid, um, the way to get out of an echo chamber is just painful expansion into stuff that you don't like hearing uh, and you have to be willing to uh, to endure some pain to uh, to see things that don't fit uh, don't fit your narrative um, and, and I'm not I'm not great at that but I do try to I do try to to, to practice that and uh, you know the, there are some people who say like they intentionally go to all the to the whole spectrum of political sites to keep their their perspective wide I'm just not interested enough to do that but but I do try to like you know, remain open to the idea that, that I'm wrong and, and practice like, um, I think it's good to like, like 
like for metaphysics, I've written about this in terms of like, uh, in terms of like, uh, like for example, solipsism. I'm not, I don't, I don't actually believe in solipsism, but if I can go temporarily into that space, um, it's helpful and I can pull out of it or determinism. You know, I can go temporarily. If I start to think I'm better than other people, then I, I go into determinism mind space and under determinism, any way that I'm better than anyone else is a hundred percent luck. And I can't go around thinking, Oh, I'm, I'm all smart and these people are stupid because I'm just lucky and they're unlucky. And that's a, and you go into determinism and then it does its job and you go out of it. So I, I think that that's a good mental skill is to, is uh, to practice going into and out of ways of thinking. And if a way of thinking is fun and compelling, then it's easier to get into it and harder to get out of it. But, but uh, you have to practice that. Rand, do you have, um, what's some of the examples of where you've changed your mind? Um, I guess I'd go, I guess I look more like, like I used to think that, um, that the, system, the whole system was going to collapse. Like if you look back at stuff I was writing, like in, in 2003, like about 20 years ago, I, I thought that, uh, that the whole, I, I thought the, the whole global society was a lot more delicate than it turns out to be. Like people use the, the house of cards metaphor. The whole thing is going to come down like a house of cards. Well, if, if, if and, uh, the moment that I kind of changed my mind on that was, uh, was Hurricane Katrina. And if you'd ask people like a year before Hurricane Katrina, what would happen if America's largest port city uh, would be shut down for, for months? They would say, oh, it would cause a cascading series of effects and uh, we'd, all be, uh, we'd all be living in, in the ruins. But, but actually, no, it, it just kind of where I was, the only effect of Katrina was gas prices got a little higher. So, so uh, I changed my mind on how fragile or how robust uh, the human society is. It's, it, really, uh, it really can take a lot of pretty hard hits. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, every, every complex society eventually falls. And uh, I think there's going to be some event, I know I'm going off on a tangent here, there's going to be some event in the future where that everyone looks back on you know, the effect of the, the equivalent of like, uh, like the Visigoths sacking Rome. The people that don't know much about Rome Ancient Rome would be like, oh, Rome was just buzzing along fine, and then one day the Visigoths sacked it, and then it was over. When really it was it was weakening for hundreds of years before that event happened, and continued weakening for hundreds of years after. So I think now, I think we get we're going to have a, a Visigoths sack Rome event. It hasn't happened yet. The history will look back. People, you know, dumb history will look back and say, oh, that's when it all collapsed. And to us, it'd be like, oh, that's just another bad thing that happened. Um, so. Uh, Going back to the subject of what I've changed my mind on, like uh, the uh, the critique of civilization. I mean, I haven't exactly. I still think that I still think that the best the best primitive tribes live better than us. And and um, you know, if you could pick any society that ever any human society that ever happened in the history of the world, in fact, are the best ones. They would all be like like nature based cultures. But at the same time, a lot of nature based cultures are terrible. So so. The, the the you know tribal people were in the whole range from from living a lot better than us to living a lot worse in terms of like subjective quality of life. Um, so I used to write a lot about civilization, and now I I kind of stopped using that word because it has too much baggage. Like the word civilization points to points to things that I'm against, like like central control and empire, and it also points to stuff I'm in favor of, which is like people getting nicer uh, to each other. And those don't necessarily go together. Um, have you heard of Dmitry Orlov? Yeah, I actually um, I read his stuff. I haven't been, I haven't read his stuff recently, but uh, like like back in the back in the audience, I actually uh, uh, emailed back and forth with him a couple times, and I read his stuff. He's a yeah, he's an interesting thinker. Yeah, I just wonder if he, yeah, I mean, he definitely thinks, well, he leans more to the West in his analysis, but I mean, he does have the example of Russia collapsing and I kind of lean yeah. to the long emergency kind of framework uh -huh. like you. Okay. It's okay. Collapse takes centuries. It's not like an instant thing. Um, yeah. And some things get better, I, some things get worse. So it's hard to know. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. I am I concerned. Sure. Go ahead. Just personally, you know, were you, um, 
I, I don't know. I just wonder in your writing, do you have any topics you want to write about but can't or self-censorship or anything like that? Or you... um, not, not really. I mean, I, I see a lot of, you know, there is a, there's a, um, the, the left right now has a pretty, uh, has a, a certain things that it doesn't want people to say, but I'm not really interested in saying those things. Um, so, uh, um, I mean, the, the main self-censorship is I just, just, I don't write about, I stop writing about, uh, about politics because I'm tired of arguing. Um, and, uh, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's funny that some of the, some of the, it's what I'm, some of the, the most hostility I get is when I'm too optimistic. You know, when I say like, oh, the, you know, like I said something nice about uh, Steven Pinker and his idea that uh, his, uh, and well, like his idea that humans are getting progressively nicer, and people get pissed off about that. And and it and it's true. Like when you look at Steven Pinker, his reasons for why he thinks the the people are getting nicer don't, don't really add up, but I think the data is accurate that that uh, you know I I believe in something like moral progress or ethical progress, and uh, and that's that's uh, oddly one of the things that I, that I've got the most pushback from writing about that the people are getting nicer. I think we are, and you know over time, you know if you look back thousands of years ago, there's all kinds of terrible stuff that's not going on now, and I think in thousands of years there'll be terrible stuff that's going on now that will not be going on. At the same time, there's going to be new crazy stuff but to go back to your question i yeah i don't really uh other than not not writing about the hot button subjects anymore um i, I don't really do any self-censorship and uh and uh yeah um and then ran maybe just to wind it down how do you design or build your moral framework then oh that's an interesting question how do i design and build my moral framework i mean i I think, uh, um, I mean, this is this is an idea, I got, a phrase I got years ago from some kind of New Age book, and that is the greatest good of all life everywhere. And you know, that's my moral framework is the greatest good of all life everywhere, which which is beyond my comprehension. But I can work towards, uh, or I can work towards that. And uh, and you know, that's uh, I mean, morality is all about being unselfish. It's all about like getting out of the small view of what's good for me and the large view of what's good for other people. And, uh, and it's a, I guess that would be that's, that's, that's my moral framework. It's just like, it's like, uh, thinking about thinking, trying to understand better, um, the interests of, of more people. And, you know, at the same time, I know what makes me happy. I don't know. What, I directly experience what makes me happy and I don't directly experience what makes other people happy, nor do they experience what makes me happy. So, so at the same time, I have to, I have to serve myself. I have to do what makes me feel good. And, and that's balanced against like trying to figure out uh, what other people need and not, not stepping on other people's toes. So that, I guess that's my moral framework. To maximize the good in the world, I guess it's your, or even in all layers. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I mean, and <laughs> it's hard to find like, if you say like, okay, the greatest good, well, what it gets into hard stuff to find, but, but, but it's a challenge. It's a constant challenge to try to work out like, like what to do. Like, I'm, I wonder if, uh, if, if in, in hundreds of years, they'll look back. I wonder if I'll get canceled in hundreds of years because I eat factory farm meat, you know, that's it. Uh, but, uh, but that's something I do. And, uh, and, uh, I'm, and, uh, I look forward to some future world where, where we'll be able to eat without that. But, uh, but right now that's too much of a sacrifice for me to make is to, is to give up eating meat. Oh yeah. Well, that's a whole world of uh, topics. I, yeah. I heard the most interesting argument against vegetarianism was the moral value of all the animals alive. Oh, so okay. are I you, mean, there's just so many animals, billions of animals that are, you know, obviously okay. they're factory farming versus like an organic, wonderful farm and a, yeah. you know, a rural place. So it's just an interesting thing. You'd have to terminate all those lives and all. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, I, that's, that's an interesting idea. I kind of say there's better to not exist at all than to exist 
as a factory farm animal. Um, but but another argument I've seen is like the vegetables to clear to clear farmland to grow vegetables. A lot of a lot of animals have to be killed. A lot of ecos a lot of uh, you know you have to cut down a forest to to build those fields. And a lot of creatures that we're living in in whatever the field is now in uh, have their their way of life destroyed. So there's no there's no morally pure way to eat, although there could be in the future. Like like this is my utopian vision is that is uh, genetically modified trees so that everywhere you go you can just live by eating the fruit off trees, which is totally unrealistic now. But who knows in a thousand years maybe we'll just be able to live off eating the fruit off trees. We'll see. Very complex. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, Ren, is there anything else you want to discuss today? I mean, there's a hundred topics I could ask you, but I don't want to take more of your yeah. time. Yeah. My, my voice is getting a little tired, so I think I probably better, better hang it up. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's been nice. Yeah.